Hey, everybody. You are about to hear a brief retelling of the movie Beasts of No Nation. Enjoy the show. A civil war has broken out in an African country. The school where Egu studied was destroyed, and now the children have to invent how to entertain themselves. Like watching imaginary TV without a screen, where they are themselves instead of actors. Egu and the other refugees live in a buffer zone, whose security is provided by the Nigerians. The kind military agreed to exchange this garbage for food. His mother works hard to feed Egu and his brothers. His father used to be a teacher, but now deals with refugee issues. His older brother only cares about his muscles and hair. Egu sometimes helps him wash his hair. The boys cut down a branch and threw it on the road to block the way of a passing car. For a fee of a few coins, they got the branch out of the way. Suddenly, they were attacked by a crazy woman who hates the Egu family and all the locals. And Egu's grandfather says the lights are on, but nobody's home. During dinner, the father saw that the drawer from his TV set had been removed and the insides had been placed on the books. That's how Egu made two TV sets out of one. The radio is broadcasting disturbing news. The rebels are winning. A military junta has seized control of the country. Armed men in armored vehicles, breaking the rules, drove into the buffer zone. The community gathers in the church and decides what they will do next. Women and children are urgently taken out en masse to safety. Egu's mother wanted to leave with him and the youngest child, but the driver refused to take the boy. There were no more seats. Egu cried and had to stay with the men. There is fighting in the streets of the city. Civilians are shot without a second thought. A family hid in one of the buildings, and suddenly a cannon was fired at them. Many panicked and ran outside. They were immediately shot. The rest were staked and interrogated by government soldiers. The locals were to be identified by one woman. It turned out that their lives were in the hands of a mad woman, and she said she didn't know any of them. So they're rebels. The commander ordered them all executed. Papa and Grandpa were shot. Egu and his brother managed to escape, but they were chased and shot after. Soon his brother's face is blown off by a machine gun and Egu is left all alone. He walks through the forest and cries. The next day, Egu comes across an abandoned hut, but he cannot find anything to eat or make a fire. He has to eat leaves. After wandering around the jungle for a while, he encountered a group of armed teenagers who were part of the army of one of the rebel factions. He was brought to the chief, the commandant. He decides what to do with the boy and asks him how he got here. Egu tells him everything as it is, that the government troops killed his father and brother. The commandant decided that he would raise him and make him a warrior who would take revenge on the army that had deprived him of his family. The boy was immediately given a box of ammunition that he would carry through the jungle. After a while, they reached the camp. Egu and the other recruits, mostly children, would soon be initiated as soldiers. Our hero is taken aside and ordered by another teenager to train him. Everyone around except Egu is eating porridge. He also asked to eat, which caused the soldiers only laughter. He was made to stand on a stool and salute. He saw little striker running into the commandant's hut. During training, the recruits were given sticks instead of assault rifles. The rebels have not forgotten the brainwashing. They refuse to recognize the current government, which has robbed them and deprived them of natural resources. On the battlefield, the militia of the people's self-defense does not think and performs the mission and destroys anyone who threatens him. At leisure, the soldiers entertain themselves with a game of soccer, which at any moment can turn into a scuffle. The commandant for the militia is not just a commander, but a mentor with the privileges of a king. His men are fighting against both the old government and the military hunter. For Egu, it was time for initiation. The recruits were seated over coals and were pelted with thick smoke. Afterward, the boy ran through the crowd who beat him with sticks. A boy who fainted during the ordeal had his throat slit. Aga was put in a grave to be reborn that way. The last stage was a firing squad. The machine guns were loaded with blank cartridges, but the commandant told the boys that they were now invulnerable to their enemies. That's the end of the fun, according to the commandant. They're going to war. 
The enemies of the rebels could find nothing, so the camp was burned to the ground. Egu comes under the jungle again with a case of ammunition on his head. Upon reaching the bridge, the guerrillas set up an ambush. Soon a convoy of vehicles showed up, a kid with a grenade launcher ran out in front of it and blew up the first vehicle. The soldiers riddled the rest of the transport, sending more than a dozen people to the grave, one of whom was captured. It was time for Egu to undergo initiation through the killing of a prisoner. The man swears that he is an engineer and was supposed to build bridges, but the commandant doesn't listen to him. Instead, he hands the kid a machete and suggests he imagine he's a hard melon in front of him. Men like him had killed his father. Egu struck the first blow not hard, the experienced striker came over and showed him how to strike. As the captive fell to the ground, the boys continued to deliver blow after blow until they had turned the man into mincemeat. That's how Egu deserved to get his machine gun. Striker's mute handed him the uniforms they had taken off the dead. The younger fighters have become friends. When they don't have to kill, they play like normal kids. A helicopter flew by in the sky and everyone immediately hid in the grass. During the night, refugees came to the UNS camp, whose village was overrun by the enemy army and killed most of the population. Well, says the commandant, then we'll fight it off. During the assault, Egu miraculously missed a stray bullet. Only part of the battalion under the command of the deputy commander attacked. The main forces are at the edge of the village. The commandant called Strike and Egu to show them through the sniper's scope how they were hitting the enemy positions with mortars. It seems his new little favorite is becoming Egu instead of Striker. The commandant set the rest of the soldiers to go into battle and they rushed to take the bridge. They used grenade launchers and machine guns. Egu shoots at people for the first time with a machine gun. As a result of a successful attack, the enemy was forced out of the village. The rebels celebrated this event with a victory dance. However, they lost 11 fighters, whose pockets were immediately emptied. The commandant promises that if he captures the town, he will be promoted to general. The man called Egu to his house. He tells him that they are getting closer to the capital where Egu's mom is now. Then he invited the boy into his bedroom, gave him a present, and told him he was special. Then he ordered him to kneel down and do what strikes had to do before. A friend guessed what Egu had just been through crying and helped him to the fire. The UN's army continues on its way. The soldiers approached the town and while still in the field began shooting civilians. The carnage continued in the city itself, with dozens of bodies lying in the streets. Egu is constantly drugged with substances and he already perceives with a smile the hell that is going on around him. The boy ran into a rich house. During the sweep the squad found a woman hiding with her daughter in a closet. Egu fell to his knees and hugged her, calling her his mother. Then he came to his senses and accused the stranger of being a witch and drugging him. The girl was taken from her and kicked to death. The rest of the outlaws threw the woman on the bed, well Egu spoiled the fun and shot her. No one in the town was left alive, and the last two residents were executed by shoving grenades in their teeth. The warriors drove with an important look into the large town that houses the headquarters of the UNS. However, the leader preferred to meet with some Asian man first rather than the commandant. Evening came, and good blood only accepted foreigners in suits, forcing his loyal officer to languish outside. Eventually, the company was seated in the reception room and given a bag of water each. Finally, the next morning, the commandant was granted an audience with the supreme commander. The soldiers were allowed to gorge themselves on the food that had been left on the table. Good blood said that the whole world had heard about the conflict and the organization now had to keep its face. They won't go to the capital and he won't make the commandant a general. And his battalion will now be commanded by the deputy commander. The commandant from now on gets the position of deputy chief of security and what will be his pay. How much of his resources will he get? Good blood replies that he's just a soldier and it's his duty to obey. That's all. The commandant announced that there would be a party today and led the soldiers to some inconspicuous bar. The boys were given warm beer. The worried deputy commander wanted to leave, but the commander-in-chief wouldn't let him go. 
Each of them got a girl, except for the smallest ones, they were left to guard the weapons. Suddenly there was a shot, one of the girls was playing with a gun and shot the deputy commander. The deputy commander thinks the commandant set the whole thing up. The brothel owner and the guilty girl were immediately shot and the others were taken away with them. The deputy commander died, he took Aga's hand and said it was all for nothing. And then he took his breath away. That's how the battalion handover ceremony changed to a funeral, then the commandant announced that from now on the supreme commander is their enemy, they should take the territories and fill their pockets. Egu concluded that the only way not to fight was to be dead. During the night, their camp was hit by an airstrike, killing many, including the new deputy commander. Even if the war ends, Egu can no longer return to his childhood activities. He has nowhere else to go. Due to food shortages, they have to eat grasshoppers. Just as the squad settles down to rest, gunshots are heard. For some reason, Stryker refuses to go any further. It turned out that the boy was badly wounded, Egu threw Stryker on his back to save his friend. He was very tired, but continued to carry Stryker until one moment he realized that he was dead. The body of the little fighter was covered with leaves and left lying in the middle of the jungle. The former UNS soldiers sit in deep flooded trenches, long past the point of not knowing what they are doing here. Egu was sent to fetch ammunition for a machine gun, but ran out of ammunition. The commandant calls Egu his son, which means the boy must protect his father. The new deputy commander tells the commandant that they are leaving. The soldiers have been sitting here at the gold mine for months and they haven't found any gold. Now they have no ammunition to shoot the enemy, no money, no food, people are getting sick and dying every day. It's madness. The commandant is intimidating his men, they're either going to jail or death and I've got nowhere to go. An uneducated bastard their families won't even want to deal with, he's their future. The deputy commander pointed an automatic rifle at the man, but he had no ammunition and then Egu turned the muzzle of his automatic rifle on the commandant, he knelt down and asked Egu to shoot him. Do you want to surrender? The commandant asks him, pointing the gun at his head. Yes, replies the boy. Well, get out of here, let his men go, the frustrated general lets them go. In his opinion, they will come again at his first call. Not one man stayed with the commandant. The lost children surrendered to the UN troops at the first opportunity. The youngest were put in a car at night, the rest were placed on the sand. After a while, Egu found himself in a missionary school in a safe part of the country. The boy stays away from the frolicking kids, he's in withdrawal. He has nightmares at night and remembers the smell of dead bodies for the rest of his life. Even though the kids now have food, shelter, and education, some of them are eager to go back to war. Ega looks at the psychologist like an old man looks at a girl because he knows what war is, but she does not. The boy has seen terrible things and done terrible things, so if he talks about them, it will upset both him and the psychologist. The woman will think he's a beast or the devil, and all he wants is to be happy in this life. Finally, Egu ran to the children playing. He will try to start a new life. 